but in a positive way, uh, that uh, we may not have enough time. So, but I don't want to cut off any discussion, either of the discussion about the uh, pandemic and healthcare spending, or the even more important discussion about our future priorities. But we do, as David will go through the agenda, we do have one vote that needs to be taken to decide whether uh, David should join the roles of the unemployed or stay with us for a little while longer. So um, I've asked um, Colleen, because I tend to get wrapped up in all the discussion, to make sure that uh, I stop the discussion um, if we haven't reached it yet um, at a quarter to two, because I know a few of you have to leave. So we will um, have the discussion about the, the executive director's performance review around a quarter to two. And then for those of you who could stay, and hopefully those of you who are watching as well, we will continue wherever we left off about our priorities and about the health equity framework, which I think is critically important. And I'm really Im impressed and pleased with what the staff has put together. So um, I didn't mean to go through the agenda, David, but I think it's important that we lay out um, how we're going to do it. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. Uh, thank you, Stuart, and uh, I, will, I will wait on pins and needles for the remainder of this meeting to see uh, what my fate uh, is determined to be. Um, but as you said, we really have a, a really full agenda, a lot of great information here. So I, I will, um, at the risk of, of repeating a little bit here just to, to lay out what we hope to achieve today. Um, really, this is me meeting is a continuation of the robust discussions we've had at the last two meetings on the impact of COVID-19 on the healthcare system and specifically the role and agenda for the HPC's work in light of this uh, historic disruption um, and, and perhaps an opportunity. Uh, we'll begin as we have before with a data update from David Auerbach on the latest trends on healthcare utilization and revenue from both national and local data sources um, we'll then turn to uh, return to a conversation on the HPC's role and new prioritized work streams for the rest of the calendar year uh, and beyond. And we'll also briefly touch on uh, this year's cost trends hearings uh, as part of that conversation. Following that discussion, uh, we are, are really excited uh, to bring to you for your input and feedback uh, a proposal for a health equity framework for the HPC's work. Uh, while advancing health equity has been an implicit component of the HPC's mission, uh, the inequities facing the Commonwealth and across the country uh, have called to light the urgent need to make this effort an explicit high priority focus for the agency. Uh, so we're looking forward to your thoughts on this topic today and in future meetings. And we'll close with a brief executive director's report and a piece of personnel business as you already summarized. So uh, with that, uh, I think we can get right into the agenda. Uh, Stuart, I'll turn it back over to you to lead a motion on uh, uh, the minutes from last meeting. Stuart. Stop anyway. Anyway, we have the uh, minutes for the June 10th meeting. Are there any additions or changes that anybody wants to make? Please raise your hand. Uh, you raise your hand by going into the Zoom little cat and put in your. All right. I don't see any hands. Okay. So I will. Uh, accept a motion to approve the minutes of June 10th. All, so raise your all hand, all in favor, aye. Stuart, I do have to take a roll call vote, vote sorry. On, okay, go ahead. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, how do you vote? Yes, aye. 
Mr. Vice Chair Marty Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Berwick. Aye. Commissioner Blakeney. Aye. Commissioner Cutler. Aye. Commissioner Foley. Aye. Commissioner Kreider. Dr. Kreider. Aye. Says aye. Uh, Commissioner Master Giovanni. Aye. Commissioner Peters. Aye. Commissioner Roeder. Aye. Okay. Unanimous. Hey, Colleen, you skipped me. This is Commissioner right. Lord, I apologize. That's okay. How do you, how do you vote, sir? Aye. <laughs> okay, I will then turn it back to David. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to uh, immediately turn this right over to David Auerbach for uh, the next update on uh, the latest from the, the data. Great. Thank you, David. Okay. For today's installation of the data update, um, we're starting with a summary here, and there will be a number of slides that will go into more detail of most of these bullet points that you see here, but I'll run down the summary first. Okay. Um, and a, a lot of this update will have data all the way through June, so it's, it's getting pretty recent. Um, to start out, we now have the, the final tally of, uh, of the drop in spending that occurred in April. And um, hopefully that'll be the, the month of maximal impact. And it was about 30% below spending April of 2019. Um, and so far, uh, the projections that we discussed in the last meeting um, seem to still be roughly on track with, with what we would have expected, about a 10% drop for the full of calendar year 2020 compared to 2019. And that, um, that's even, even more impactful than it might sound if you think in the context of healthcare spending without the pandemic would have gone up in 2020. So you can probably think of that if it turns out to be minus 10%, that's about 12, 13% below what it would have been. Um, in the second bullet, healthcare spending dropped faster than the overall economy. Uh, is, as you'll see in the next slide, that 30% is much more than the drop in GDP. But healthcare employment dropped slower than employment in all other sectors, suggesting that healthcare employers are, have been holding on to their, to their employees despite the drop in, in revenue. Um, we have uh, some information on hospitals through just the first quarter of 2020 from Chia that we'll show where most of them had negative margins in that first quarter. Um, we have some information, but not very much on what's happening with health insurers. You would think that um, with the drop in spending that they are overall doing well. One large for-profit insurer uh, reported in the second quarter of 2020 um, a doubling of profits and a 70% medical loss ratio. Um, meaning that about 70% of total money taken in went out in the form of claims. That's compared to 83% last year in the same period. So much less medical spending from their, from their um, uh, point of view. Um, we have a, an additional update slide from that survey of physicians that we ha have shown in the past where independent primary care practices much more likely to say that they will close or likely to close due to the pandemic than non-independent practices. There's some interesting findings we'll show on differences in how the trajectory of how spending has returned for pediatric visits versus adult visits. The pediatric visits are still quite, quite down from what the baseline level would have been. And we are starting to see some trends in telehealth where we saw a massive increase in use of telehealth and has started to come down. Um, so we'll show a little more detail on that. Okay, and I'll try to go fairly quickly, but please ask questions at any point. Here's some detail on the overall spending trend for April that I mentioned. There you see the drop in personal health care of 30% compared to the GDP drop of about 14%. And then that's, we can break that down by sector, about 40% in hospital and physician services, 50% for other, 60% for dental services, home health care dropped by a third. Um, drugs and nursing home care in terms of overall spending were not much affected in April. Um, and so there are some big differences in the trends by sector. Okay. This slide is an additional update um, from a team, including David Cutler that I've shown before. And now we have this updated through mid-June. And you see it's broken out by the regions of the country. And this is showing 
uh, basically visits to physicians, NPs, PAs, and in all settings, but it is not hospital visits. And you see the relative to the baseline, which was in February, you see that drop of about almost 70% in April. And then the return where visits have really come, come back much towards that baseline. But in New England, uh, that light blue, um, it's still at about 20% below the baseline. We are the lowest line there in that curve. Um, so considerable um, return, but not back to typical by any means. Um, and you do see, sorry, I'll just stay on that for a second. You know, the, the south and, and the, the southeast, the South Atlantic, those are, those are much higher, but it, it is possible that they will have a dip as the pandemic has flared up in those areas too, but we don't see that yet. Okay. And the next slide is highlighting the difference uh, by age, which is really quite dramatic. You see basically the same slide we just showed, but now broken by the age of the person uh, coming in for the visit. And those three lines that are below are our, our children, ages zero to two, three to five, six to 17. Those are all still 30, 40, 50% off um, from baseline, whereas the adult visits have, have returned uh, within about 10% of normal on average. And people don't know exactly why that, why that is, but it's dramatic. Okay. Um, now this slide is showing, as we've shown before, also a breakdown in these visit trends by type of visit, by specialty. Um, and some interesting things to note here, the, the dark orange on the left is showing relative to baseline, the visit levels in just the very past week, 614. And on the right, the lighter orange is the cumulative drop over the whole period of March to June. And so, for example, pediatrics, as we just showed, um, is still 30% below baseline and has the largest cumulative drop as well. Um, but for example, dermatology, as you see down there, um, has a large cumulative drop as well, but it is basically back to baseline already at this point. Um, and towards the bottom, you can see behavioral health, which has a different pattern. It's still about 10% below baseline, but the cumulative, it's sort of been hanging around at that minus 10% level the whole time, um, largely due to telehealth, as we'll, as we'll start to see in the next slide. Okay, so this one is showing um, rather than by the type of specialty, here is by visits by the condition, by the reason for the visit from a different source. Um, and the two bars there for each pair is showing visits for the week of June 5th and then June 12th relative to this 100%, uh, which is the baseline. And interestingly here, you can see the in-person visits, the office is in the orange, and the telehealth, telehealth visits are in the blue. Um, and so on the far left there, um, you have a couple of behavioral health categories, ADHD, depression, um, and the telehealth visits being even more than in person. And the combined, um, you are back to baseline or even above uh, in those categories. And most of these categories are approaching the baseline level by the week of June 12th, but with smaller contributions of telehealth. And a little more on the, the, the drop in telehealth trend that I mentioned in the bullet earlier. Um, on the left graph, those, those blue bars are the numbers of telehealth visits. Um, and you can see they peaked in around April. And since then, they, they've dropped in May. And by June, they're, um, you know, they're still much higher than, you know, than in the baseline or than last year. But they are not at the April level either. And that's, that's certainly a a policy focus and a priority that we will be talking about throughout. Uh, okay. Here's, uh, as I mentioned, a little detail, uh, again, on that physician practice survey that was fielded over the past month. Um, since uh, we presented the last time, they've broken out those results. These are primary care practices, and they divided them into those that are independent and then those that are non-independent. And here, non-independent means, uh, the pr in their definition, you were owned by a hospital or a health system. So those are the orange. And uh, one of the largest contrasts here was whether they expect to have to close the practice due to the pandemic. And you see the independent offices giving about 12% uh, or so on average, saying that yes, this would happen, um, compared to almost none of the non-independent ones were, were giving that answer. So that's important to track. And there are efforts underway to think about policy responses to that. Okay, just a, a couple more. 
Um, this is a continuation of the trend in healthcare employment that we showed before, um, added a few things, it's updated to June. And I did wanna to bring in, um, on the left you see I've included February 2019 levels, just to show that, um, uh, that healthcare employment has been rising and we expect it to continue to rise as healthcare spending rises. So, it, so again, keep in, keep in mind that February 19 to February 20, most categories of healthcare employment rose two, three, four percent and absent the pandemic, we would have expected that to continue to rise. So when you see these drops, they're even more um, dramatic than, than you might think. So, you know, in that context, um, now we see going out to June, overall healthcare employment, and this is national, but I have a Massachusetts box on the left, but sticking with national numbers, still about 5% below uh, the February 2020 baseline, but some differences by category. Uh, hospital employment, um, hasn't dropped as much, but it's still about 3% off of the baseline. Offices of physicians in the dark blue um, have been coming, that employment has been coming back um, pretty steadily and is now maybe 6% below baseline. Outpatient care has returned. Nursing and home health hasn't really returned and has continued to drop somewhat. Um, and then you see in contrast to the, that gray dashed line on the bottom is non-healthcare all the rest of employment, or, or I guess it's the total including healthcare. And that drop has been bigger than the healthcare drop. Um, now, interestingly, in the, if we can compare Massachusetts to the US, and those data are through June, so the very last data point there, a couple of notable differences in that little breakout table are that offices of physicians in Massachusetts, uh, have the employment is much below compared to the US, minus 14% versus minus six. And also in nursing homes and home health, Again, uh, about 14% down in Massachusetts compared to minus five. So those are some notable drops. Hospital employment is only about 2% down in Mass. Okay. And on this final slide, this is data from Chia that I mentioned in the bullets of a, a noticeable drop in margins. And this is only through March of 2020. So if we take, take the first quarter of 2020, Compared to the first quarter of 2018 and 19, this is showing the total hospital margins, including operating and non-operating. And the, this is the median hospital margin by cohort. So you see that green line that's showing that for the median community hospital in Massachusetts, uh, the median margin was plus 2.9% in March of 19, but minus 3.6% for, for Q1 of 2020. So surely those, those are, well, almost surely those will be dropping further once we have data for Q2 of 2020. And you can see some differences by the cohort. The community hospitals, high public payer are in the dark blue. The AMCs are in the orange. So not all hospitals are negative. This is the median within that group, but those medians are all negative. Okay, I believe that's um, the full summary. Okay, happy to take any questions. Back to you, David. All right, uh, any questions of our commissioners? This was really good stuff, David. Thank you so much. I mean, you get a picture not of both of the US and Massachusetts and then by specialty in terms of visits and then employment. I think we get a pretty good picture of what's going on. But again, um, any comments or questions of any of our commissioners? I have a question. Sure. sure. Uh, David, uh, in the uh, in the slide of uh, uh, physician practices and uh, uh, expectations re regarding closure of the independent practices, uh, yeah. was that a mix of specialty physicians and primary care physicians? Sorry, this was this was just primary care. I should have I should have noted that more clearly on the slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the other comment, if you just go back to the previous slide, which showed dermatology, um, I guess one more. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you know, I, I suspect that that's because dermatology is is 100% telemedicine, um, or you know, very let's call it ridiculously high use because it's uh, it's so uh, clearly a a visual. Um, uh, specialty, and um, and I think it's a pretty vivid descriptor of why costs should go down 
right? Because if it's being done virtually, you, you just, you don't need that support staff, um, which I think averages to four and a half FTEs uh, per per physician, something, something of that order. I just think, I just wanted to point out that's, a, that's very vivid. Um, and I think suggests uh, some deflation that is, uh, that uh, should be ahead. That's a good point. And I, I do think embedded in this data, maybe David could answer, I think, I think they do have the tele and the in-person mix within each of these, I, I would guess. So that might, I could, might be able to get back to you on that. You are, you are correct, David Auerbach. Okay, great. Um, could I ask Any a question, Stuart? Um, Don? Yes, uh, uh, David, on the, back to Chris's uh, question, on the, on the physician practice closure, yeah. uh, that one. Um, okay, so this is expectations. Do we have a way with Chia or anyone to notice what, to know what practices, when practices actually do close and what's happening as opposed to what's expected? That's a great question. I, <clears throat> I, I am not sure. Probably anything we might know through Chia would, would take a while um, for the official reporting to happen. But there, the the group that is um, that ran this survey does have a a pretty good contact within all all the respondents, and I am not sure if they are planning a a follow up. But I think that they have a way to to find out in somewhat real time when this happens. And I, that's a good follow-up question for me to, to ask them as well. Um, that I agree that's important to know because these were, this is a combination of them responding to the question, how likely would I do this? And what's the, um, well, would I, would I do this? And then how likely is it? And then a combination of that to get this sort of expected uh, percent that would close. But still, it's, it's hard, that's a forecast. And so yes. we'll, yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? These are very good. Um, um, just, just a question, Stuart, on the on this actually the same slide. Do we know, uh, or does um, this survey allow us to look at geographic differences? Mm. Yes, that, they certainly know that information, and I'm not sure if they have cut it that way. But that's another that's another question that I'll I'll see if it's been done. Thank you, Tim. You wanted to say something. Yeah, thanks. And I, uh, Marty's and um, Don's question, I think, are important when we go to the health equity lens piece of this, too, knowing where and who's impacted by these closures um, is going to be important. So I think those are good questions that really track with the health equity, the, the equity lens conversation. I just did. Can you repeat? I think you said at the beginning um, about the health insurers that there was one report on one insurer about the medical loss ratio, what yes. that number was, and then when will we have? Full, uh, fuller analysis of the impact one way or the other on the payer side of this uh, to compare it in particular to the hospital losses? I don't, I don't know that. Do, do you, do you know any more about that David Seltz? Cause I, I, that is a great question and I, I don't know the answer of when we'll know for sure. Yeah. David, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, do a David Seltz. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, we've been in, in contact with the Division of Insurance, uh, Commissioner Foley, to try to get a sense of uh, what they're collecting and on what cadence and when we can expect that to be published. So uh, I don't have that answer for you now, but we are we are actively pursuing that. And um, I can get back to you as soon as I have a, a clear answer. But um, this was this was a national news report. Um, this was not a, a local data release. Okay, thank you. Uh, D to David Auerbach, um, when you look at the totality of the uh, options that you've raised, it appears that close the practice means retirement of the physician or physicians um, because they could sell it or they can consolidate or they could join. So um, one of the things that I am curious about is how much difference the the retirements are for what they normally are because you know each year a number of physicians do decide to close their practice so um yes i'm i'm glad you asked because i am i'm actually involved in a separate I'm, I'm, it's my that, job you know <laughs> i am looking carefully at that it's the the data it'll take it'll take a little while to get some insight into that but but not too long and um 
I'll certainly let you know once we start to see those trends. Right. Nurses and physicians, we expect some retirement for sure. Good. Any other comments or questions anybody wants to raise? These were all good. Again, thank you so much, David Auerbach, for again, sort of giving us a real insight into what's going on. So I'm now going to turn it back to uh, David Sells uh, to take this information, plus, as he pointed out, um, other th thoughts that are going on, both within Massachusetts, if not in the country, and um, have a broader discussion of how we should be setting our priorities for future research. So David Sells. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, just a, a few final reflections on, on the previous conversation. Uh, I noted today uh, that the Mass Medical Society uh, circulated a national survey that was done of physicians that indicated that um, this was a national survey, but that uh, many physicians, um, let's see, um, nearly half of physicians surveyed in the six weeks after the pandemic said that they had less than four weeks of cash on hand and seven in 10 uh, that were looking for partners, you know, consolidation um, were listed financial support as the primary driver. So um, we, we'll do a deep dive on that um, survey as well and compare that to some of our Massachusetts results. And I would just also note Mass Medical Society may be a, a good source of information for us to be able to track and understand uh, some of the physician employment and retirement and, and closure trends. Um, so, David, would you uh, share that uh, survey yeah. with the uh, commissioners? Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's what I was going to ask. Thanks, Stuart. Yep. Um, so, shifting to the next agenda item, um, we really wanted to uh, continue the conversation about the HPC's role and priorities in order to both, um, one, more comprehensively understand the impact of COVID-19 on all aspects of the healthcare system, care delivery, financing, workforce, um, and two, to really be able to inform and or recommend future policy decisions for uh, building a more resilient and equitable health system, um, one that meets the needs of, future, of the future potential of surges of infections, um, but also meets the needs of our residents at a time of significant economic and, and social upheaval. Um, these are big challenges. These are big questions that will require the coordination and collaboration of, of many government agencies, um, locally and nationally, and market participants and the public. Um, but uh, we believe the HPC has a, a unique position uh, to positively contribute and urgently contribute uh, to this essential work um, in areas consistent with our statutory role and expertise. And so the next few slides attempt to synthesize and summarize the discussion that we had at the last board meeting on this particular topic. And so wanted to uh, reflect this back uh, to the board for further discussion and, and validation uh, that we're headed in the right direction with our work plan. So the next slide um, here uh, highlights kind of the four major categories uh, that we're considering as a priority um, for our, our research and policy work uh, reflecting uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so uh, I will very briefly, um, and there is a slide on each of these, but one is uh, a, a comprehensive analysis of the impact across a range of different, um, both providers and health plans, employers, consumers, patients, workforce. Uh, second would be uh, a continued role in both short-term and long-term health system capacity monitoring and planning. Uh, the third major category here is uh, the evaluation of uh, the temporary policy changes that were implemented uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and to make uh, recommendations uh, for their future uh, adoption um, and, and sustainability. And then finally, a, a broad category of aligning our work in areas of our grant programs and certification programs, which aim to accelerate transformation and innovation in our healthcare system 
uh, that, that those efforts are being reflective of the tremendous transformation and innovation opportunity, uh, as well as uh, some of the really great lessons learned um, and innovations that providers and others put in place uh, during the pandemic. For each of these four areas, uh, we've also included on the slide an example of how a health equity lens will be applied to that specific work stream. Um, these are not exhaustive questions. These are not exhaustive examples. Um, but we really wanted to um, begin this, this concept of, of being intentional um, and to be, um, give you uh, and the public a sense of how an equity lens is aligned with these major four work streams. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to quickly summarize them in a little bit more detail, and then I'm, I'm going to uh, really turn it over uh, to the board. Um, so the next slide, two slides, are on kind of the impact analysis. So the first slide here uh, reflects a number of, of impact questions. This slide is, is focused uh, a little bit more on providers, workforce, and patients. Um, and so uh, see an opportunity for a, a greater examination of the short and long-term impacts across those uh, different uh, populations or different um, actors, um, as well as across a number of domains and cost, quality, and access. We know that there will be differential impacts by provider types, whether that's a community hospital versus a community health center. And so we'll be thoughtful about uh, our analysis in that regard. Um, we do think that there is uh, an interest in understanding the impact of the federal and state financial assistance that's been provided uh, to providers, uh, as well as the, the very significant financial losses uh, that they've occur, um, experienced uh, during this time period. Um, impact of, of other policy and regulatory changes specific to these areas. And then finally, you know, really want to uh, use some of our time uh, at, at staff and energy to um, think about what the potential may be for consolidation, reorganization, and closures uh, as the result of uh, the COVID-19 disruption and how that may um, uh, influence how we think about our market oversight roles uh, as we may be receiving some proposals on market consolidations uh, as soon as this fall. Um, I'll, I'll do the next slide and then, and then I'll pause, uh, Stuart. Um, the next slide is, is a, a mirror image of the slide before, but here uh, thinking about the health plan um, experience and how that translates into premiums for both employers and consumers. Again, here too, we expect that we will see differential impacts um, across um, different types of employers, uh, consumers, um, and, and here too, interested, uh, as uh, Commissioner Foley mentioned before, about what has been the financial impact and how, uh, given the information that we've seen that indicates a significant drop in healthcare spending uh, in 2020, how are health plans um, allocating those savings? Um, and, uh, and again, there were a number of, of policy and regulatory changes. So um, while there are some financial components, uh, financial analysis included in both of these slides, I think the intent is to start with a little bit of a broader viewpoint um, and that um, uh, we may be able to look at, at other things, including spending, costs, and perhaps uh, and, and access issues as well. So this is, <laughs> this is a big undertaking. This is um, uh, a, a lot of uh, work, but we think, uh, is really important for us to be able to understand the impact and then use that to inform our future policy decisions. So I will pause on this kind of uh, comprehensive impact analysis and, and open it up for discussion. Okay. Um, anybody like to jump in and, um, and push a couple of buttons? Uh, how Don? Yeah, uh, so I'll jump in uh, on the uh, the uh, windfall savings to health plans, uh, seventy percent MLR that you showed before. So, can you can maybe commissioners or you, David, speculate a little more about that? Like, what could be done about that? Um, how could we process that? I, I it's it seems to me that we, um, we should be activist about that. 
I, I'd be very interested in hearing from, from other commissioners uh, on, this, on this point as well. I, I would say, Commissioner, I think um, I, we're currently suffering from a little bit of lack of information uh, just right now in this moment. Um, and so first, we'll be needing to understand what was the experience specific to our Massachusetts health plans, uh, given the kind of the curve and progression of the pandemic and how um, hard Massachusetts was hit. Um, we, we may have a, a different experience. And so I think it's important to, for us to understand that. Um, and, and want to hear from the health plans about how they are considering, uh, you know, the reduction in spending, but also uh, what um, they may be tracking in terms of future costs related to treatment or a vaccine. Um, so I think my, my initial take is that there's, uh, this is a really important area for investigation and, and much to be learned, um, but how we will then take that information and inform policy, I, I, I think I would open that up to the other board members. Any other comments or questions either related to that? It's an important issue that Don brought up, but um, whether there are others. Well, let me... Um, I, I just a quick comment. Uh, Stuart, I, thanks. Uh, I was speak, speaking with the chief medical officer of a of a ten about a ten million member plan uh, this morning, who uh, said that they were uh, beginning to implement uh, serious uh, reductions in force. Uh, <clears throat> labor is, is their uh, is like ninety percent of their cost, uh, and the uh, uh, the, uh, the the proximate cause of that is that the commercial uh, their commercial contracts are expected to suffer because the businesses that um, normally buy health insurance are have been tapped out um, with revenue losses over the last uh, three or four months. So um, I don't I don't want to say that that is a you know a, a Perfect uh, canary uh, in a in a dark coal mine, but um, it is um, a data point, and um, I, it 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 underscores the importance of this impact analysis. Good. All right. Any other questions, um, David Stuart. Cutler? Yeah. Did you want to say something, David Selves? Uh, just just a, a quick um, response and, and just a, a note of appreciation for Dr. Kreider bringing up uh, the other dynamic, which will be important to understand here, which is there has been a significant economic disruption and what that means for, for commercial coverage. Um, and so that, that will is an important thing to, for us to understand. Uh, again, here in Massachusetts, where unfortunately our, our unemployment um, is higher than in, in some other places in the country. So uh, a, a dynamic that um, I think we will want to understand as well. So thank you. David Cutler. Um, I wanted to sort of pick up on some of those themes because it's really unclear to me what's going to happen for a couple of counts and a couple of counts. One is um, with the insurers, you know, I, they're sort of acting like they're afraid of what's going to happen to their revenue coming in. And so they're so, so, so many of them, at least nationally, are building up reserves because they don't want to be surprised by something. I think they're also giving sort of premium holidays to businesses that need it. So, they, so they're making money, is my guess, but they're afraid, they're very much afraid about it. So that's one sort of uncertainty. And then the, on the provider side, you know, I think we don't really know what's going to happen to the care that was deferred. So if that care comes back, like if it was postponed elective surgery that people decide later in the fall or next spring will come back, then over the longer term, they'll be okay. But in the shorter term, it'll be suffering. Or if the recession is sufficiently deep that people basically give it up forever or people go on to uh, less generous reimbursement policies and so either they were paid less or they don't or they the providers choose not to do it then it could be a permanent reduction in what's done I, I think so far what we've seen on the provider end is that they're sort of creeping back to normal levels without having made up that gap 
So there's still that big hole. And that's what David Auerbach pointed out as the sort of expected loss for the year. Were the economy to recover soon, one might guess that some of that deferred care would come back up. Given what's going on, it's unclear to me that that's going to happen. And so therefore, my own personal guess is that they'll be very low for the year. But I don't know that for sure. And there's at least some chance that, that they and customers will say, you know, we put off the care for a while, but now, now we need to come back to it. So I think on both ends, it's really difficult. And I, I really think, and, and I, David Seltz, you said this, we need to have a kind of real-time data monitoring thing in place so we can be figuring out what's going on. That is, does any of that hole get filled in by later stuff? Do the insurers conclude, oh, okay, it's not going to come back? You know, we're, you know, what's going on with all of that so we can get a better sense forecasting because it's just super hard. Let me, um, let, if you don't mind, I'm going to follow up uh, David Cutler. Maybe it's just us professors that are just, I mean, thank you, David, because what's running in my mind are so many different cross-cutting set of issues. So let's play out a few of them. As David's point, we, we more than know that if we're really going to get a handle on healthcare spending or costs, there is going to be an impact on employment. You can't continue to spend on the healthcare side and expect somehow that uh, costs are going to go down and and uh, and premiums are going to go down. There is some interconnectedness. It's not one for one. So um, as David Cutler pointed out. I think the delivery system people would like to see things go back to the way they were. The hospitals would like to go back to where they were and so on and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, um, we have other demands. Um, when you bring in the equity lens, we know that there is a number of services that impact on health in cl at plus healthcare itself that has not been appropri appropriately distributed um, and therefore we need changes there. So um, the idea that in our minds, going back to what existed before is what we want, if not going up, as David Auerbach pointed out, the growth curve in healthcare has been positive over the last several years. So, um, uh, we're going to have to watch that. And again, um, if we're going to do something serious about redistributing, well, let me put it this way, we could either add services on to those who have not received uh, the same level of services, expecting that would just be an add on, or are we going to redistribute the some of the money that was spent in areas that were perhaps overconsumed. So um, answering these questions ultimately leads to a much bigger set of issues. I think in the short run, we probably ought to be doing what David Cutler said, and that is just monitoring it. But if we're going to have a role in terms of impacting on the structure of how we spend our money and how much we spend, Ultimately, we're going to need to get into these more complicated issues. I raise this as much for your staff, David Selves, as for our commissioners. They need to be very conscious um, as they begin to collect. And I'm sure David Auerbach needs no lecture on the complexity. But I just want to put it out there that um, we're going to need to look at we're going to need, as you pointed out, an equity lens, but also a structural lens as we look at the changing trends. You're shaking your head, Cells. I hope you agree. It, it was a nodding, nodding, shaking. Yes, yes, Stuart. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in because this is really complicated stuff. Hey, David Auerbach, um, you know, if you, as you look into the research that's going on, 
I hope you'll bring to our, our attention any articles or comments that are being made along these lines so we can learn from others. Stuart, one small but maybe not so small uh, codicil to your and David's advice has to do with the telemedicine piece, which is I don't think we know yet whether the telemedicine that remains is going to displace face-to-face uh, -face visits in the longer run or be added to them. And that's both about quality and access to care, but it's also about total cost. And I hope David Auerbach and his team can help us track, track that. Technologies like that tend to become, in the longer run, add-ons, not replacements. And uh, I would add, what do you pay for telehealth? When I heard the discussion um, last time from the providers, when I listened, I, I um, went to our health policy commission um, when we have all of the different stakeholders talk to David Sells. It was clear from the perspective of a number of the delivery people that they expect or want, I don't know which comes first, um, telehealth to be paid, which is now being paid at full amounts, when a lot of us believe telehealth is an efficiency issue as well as a changing structure and the idea that you're going to either, as you pointed out, Don, add on, or even if you substitute, if you wind up substituting and just paying the same rate, you're not going to see any of the efficiencies. So. Um, yeah, that's an know. analytic problem that right now most of the policy maneuvers uh, moves are toward maintaining quote parity like you pay the same for telehealth as face to face. But I think we need a lot of analytics behind that about what would actually make exactly. sense. I, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. Other comments or questions, please jump in because I'm sure the staff would benefit from early issues that you want to bring up so that they can when they do their analysis, they'll take it into account. Stuart, I have a, a few more slides on this on the work stream topic, so maybe I can move through a couple more and, and pause again. That's great, David. Thank you. Great. So the next um, kind of area category um, that we're proposing to prioritize is in health system capacity monitoring and planning. And so in the short term, we are already today supporting the, administ um, the administration's COVID-19 command center and the Department of Public Health by doing daily uh, analysis of hospital bed capacity, um, which is being used to uh, directly inform and influence both the reopen strategy of the Commonwealth, as well as planning for resurgence and, and what we'll need in terms of healthcare capacity uh, with a, a, a potential second wave or, or resurgence. As part of that, we are also um, doing biweekly analysis of uh, capacity in the LTAC, which is a long-term acute care hospital uh, space. So this, this kind of real time, this is, this is real time data. We get this data every single day um, and prepare graphs and analyses that go um, on, online every day through the DPH dashboard, as well as to the governor uh, directly. Um, and again, in terms of uh, really helpful and important for, for planning, but this is a really a, an administration-wide effort. The second bullet here um, is, is really thinking about uh, less day-to-day -day capacity planning and more longer-term capacity planning and thinking about uh, a role for the Health Policy Commission in um, using its data resources to inform a comprehensive analysis of healthcare resources in the Commonwealth and especially where they are relative to need, preparedness, and what we expect need and preparedness to be in the future. Um, we have some unique data sets, as many of you know, through the registration of, of provider organizations, uh, which uh, is um, a database and resource that gives tremendous information about the structure and organization of our healthcare system, and so can be a really powerful tool um, for some of this health planning capacity planning work. Uh, again, with all of these, uh, we do anticipate that these will be done in, in collaboration and in partnership with, with other state agencies, um, but here uh, saw a role for the HPC in, in dedicating some effort um, to this particular topic. Um, and again, consistent with both our data resources and 
our ongoing market monitoring, uh, which plays into this as well as we think about potential consolidations, closures, uh, and other new relationships among healthcare providers and health plans. The next slide is our um, next two slides are our is the third category of, of uh, agenda priorities for the HPC. So this category is evaluation of policy changes during COVID. And so here we've identified uh, four policy changes that were put in place uh, during the public health emergency. And um, that we believe are um, provide a, a really unique natural experiment to understand what the impact of these policy changes was, but also most importantly to inform uh, a potential policy recommendation that the HPC would make to the legislature or to the governor or other policymakers about how we would want to see these policies extended into the future and perhaps adapted um, uh, in coordination with that extension. And so I won't walk through these in detail. I think we've, we've talked about many of these. Um, one was around uh, re uh, relaxing outdated scope of practice restrictions. Uh, the second, which we've talked a lot about is uh, telehealth coverage and payment. Um, the third on the next slide is uh, there were changes to um, member cost sharing and prior authorization. Um, and then finally, there were some unique protections put in place uh, specific to COVID, but uh, nonetheless, an interesting model of, of a policy framework for out-of-network um, care. Uh, again, a, a long-term priority of the Health Policy Commission. So uh, with all of these, I think we would want to both understand um, what the experience has been. And as I said, think about a potential policy recommendation for the future. I would note just very um, briefly, um, uh, I want to recognize uh, both the House and Senate um, in, our, in our state legislature who are both considering uh, legislation um, that would um, specific on the telehealth piece, extend uh, many of those, much of that policy into the future. Um, and while that bill has, uh, has not yet um, been passed, I think that the House is planning to debate legislation uh, as early as, as this week, I think. Um, uh, there, there is a growing consensus among um, policymakers that uh, th in particular that policy should be extended um, into some date in the future to allow for uh, this type of, of evaluation and policy recommendation in the interim. So I'll pause there on, yeah. on these last two categories. Okay, David Cutler. Um, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, David. D David Seltz, are there any of these policies that expire, are set to expire soon? And if so- David, can you get a little closer to your mic? I apologize, Stuart, I apologize. Well, because I, I really want to hear what you say. <laughs> are there any of these policies that expire soon for which it would be helpful for us to weigh in to the legislature on temporarily continuing them or not? So I, I, I want to be careful in not speaking for the administration and, and their legal position um, on what is required to uh, sustain some of these temporary policy changes. But um, I, I think uh, many of them will be continued throughout the public health emergency. Um, and and um, may require at the time that the public health emergency is is declared um, to be closed, may require statutory changes or other uh, emergency uh, regulation uh, policies uh, and changes. So uh, I, I don't want to go through each of these and, and um, relay what I think the is necessary. Um, again, I don't want to. Um, speak for the administration on this point, but uh, the, 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 the public health emergency is, is a crucial um, dynamic here. Uh, Rick Lord. Uh, yeah, David, just a quick question. Under the scope of practice um, bullets, you mentioned advanced practice nurses, uh, which is great, but weren't there some other positions that we've been talking about where um, changes could be made to I think optometrists versus ophthalmologists and, and a few others. Uh, are we monitoring those too? 
Yes, and I would. That, I think that's a, a great tee up, um, Commissioner Lord, to a, a comment that I probably should have said at the beginning that these four work streams are, are really um, in addition to uh, all of the work that we are, are already uh, working on and have been prioritized and, and our, our day to day mandate. And so while the temporary policy changes did not necessarily apply to some of those other categories. The other one that we've um, recommended in the past is the establishment of a dental hygienist um, uh, position uh, within the Commonwealth. Um, I think we would, we would continue to advocate and monitor broader scope of practice policy uh, issues and to continue to make recommendations on those even beyond just um, this one, which was, this is more specific just to the, the COVID policy changes. So uh, not, uh, you know, this is not an exclusive list of the things that we'll continue to track and uh, appreciate the comment because there are um, places where we've gone beyond even what was put in place in the temporary uh, policies. Great, thanks, Tim. Tim? Yeah, just on that a little bit, just I'm wondering, David, are these, is this like an exhaustive list of all the policy changes or are these the ones that you thought fit within the HPC? It would be good just, I, I know I have it somewhere, but a list of the ones that the HPC is not examining in terms of uh, some of the policy changes that happened that you've decided don't fit and we should take a pass on. I think that'd just be helpful to see which errors are not examining as well. Do you have what you, what, any you're thinking about, Tim? I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know there's a lot of them. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what is the, where does that list exist of all the policy changes that have happened? Uh, and of those, these are the ones that we chose. I'm just trying to figure out what are the ones that we didn't. I think yeah. that's right. Well, we talked about one before, which was the issue about paying for telehealth at parity, which was considered temporary. And also there were a couple of others where we asked the insurance companies to pay full amounts for, um, vaccines and a whole bunch of things like that where traditionally they had co-payments and stuff like that. There are, all, there are a number of them that have been put in place temporarily. Um, Ron? Well, Stuart, just to quickly respond, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, um, Commissioner Master Giovanni. Um, Tim, we can we can certainly get you that list. It is it is a very long list. There there was a, a tremendous response by the administration, and I want to recognize um, Cassandra and Warren Peters here, who uh, I mean uh, have done tremendous work on behalf of the Commonwealth and and putting forward a, a whole <laughs> many 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 suites of 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 really rapid and thoughtful policies. So I, this is not exhaustive. We can get you that list, and I'd be happy to kind of you know, have a conversation and think through, are there other ones on there? I, I think there are a lot. Um, and so, um, but uh, happy to kind of continue that conversation. Thank you. Ron? Do you have your mute on? Yeah, no, I'm all set now. Um, okay. I have a question based upon the previous conversation and maybe something, I'm not sure how we would look at this, but given the limited number of relationships I have with provider organizations, what I'm finding is when they started getting hit with the costs related to COVID, and from what I know, when I'm looking at some of the cuts that are being made, they're not necessarily related to COVID. Uh, a lot of this is fact that they would have wanted to get rid of anyway, right? And then they're looking at other factors as well. And those factors may not you know, as because these are organizations that are trying to run an organization, they don't necessarily, and are we looking at where they're making cuts to see if it truly is in the best interest of the patient as well as the organization? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. And trying to figure that one out is not easy. Don, no. I, don't want, I don't know where, if anybody wants to add to Ron's, but uh, Don Berwick? I'm not, I don't have an answer for Ron. I have a different point. Do you want me to see if anyone else has an answer for Ron first? Well, uh, I, we're going to have to look into that. There's no easy answer to it. It's the right question, hard answer. So, Stuart, uh, just a point. If, <clears throat> if in evaluating these policy changes, I think it's important that we also reach out to consumer groups to really find out uh, 
how they're impacting uh, folks who rely on these services. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if these comments, Mike, following two comments are out of order or not, Stuart, because it's not exactly about policy changes, but they're pickups on the COVID patterns. One was the uh, enormous decrease in dental care and what that means. I mean, that's a, that was, I mean, the bottom fell out there and, and uh, we, we should be taking a look at what happened and what mitigated or didn't mitigate that. Um, oh shoot, I lost the other, uh, I lost my other thought. I'll, I'll come back to one. one well, while time. you're thinking about it, I'm sure you'll remember it. Let me really muddy the waters. Having, um, maybe I'm the only one my age comes out, having lived through the health planning days of the 1970s and 80s. So, uh, forgive me for a little bit of a lecture. One of the issues that separates the United States from other countries is we have among the lowest number of beds per capita in the world, uh, uh, the industrialized world. But a bed in the United States is very different than a bed in Italy or even in England or France. Our beds and our hospitals are high tech much more. And that gets me to the issue of ICUs. There was, I wouldn't say a lot, but there was a a number of critics, including myself, that felt that we had too many ICU beds. Uh, and an ICU bed is a very expensive bed to keep up because you have to staff them, you got to have the equipment and so on. So we have among the highest proportion of our beds that are ICU in the world. And while we're busy criticizing ourselves, rightly so, for a lot of things we did wrong, the truth of the matter is we had more ICU capacity. Now, of course, we got hit with so many more um, uh, problems so that the ICU capacity was, in many cases, really pressed. So now we get to the issue of what do we staff up for going forward? Do we staff up the way, oh, and I wanna add two other things. Inventory, the hospitals to their credit develop what are considered the state of the art inventory controls, which is to minimize their existing inventory and count on the supply chain to get it to them when they need it. Well, of course that turned out to be a disaster in an environment where every country was holding on to their own inventory and we needed such impact, we couldn't get it fast enough. So now do we develop a major um, expansion of inventory and in hot? We're talking about substantial costs. These are not nickels and dimes. If you add beds, ICU and inventory and substantially expand what existed before. So you've put it list, and I don't wanna muddy the waters, but those waters are gonna get muddied. So I would just ask David Sells, um, as you think through what the future holds, you can't ignore these basics of what our delivery system looks like, I'm sorry. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has any comments, but, and I don't know the answer. And I will tell you this, the older I get, and unfortunately the sicker I get, the more I wanna make sure we have those ICU beds. So this is not a personal comment, but it is an impact on our system. Stuart, I'll jump in and comment on that. First, it's a, it's a engineering problem in part because some of the countries that were most capable in dealing with this epidemic didn't have a ton of ICU capacity, but they had the flex capacity. They were able to convert to much more intensive care. So we should treat your question with enormous sophistication about pop, pop, proper designs, because sometimes the worst solution is always to staff up for the worst case in a steady state. I also thought of my other question, if I could just slip that back in, I'm sorry for being disruptive uh, in flow, but it, we, we do have a chance to look here at the relative experience 
importance of risk bearing models um, versus uh, standard fee for service models of care. And I think the analytics could, I mean, David could be creative in figuring out just how the, those who are in uh, alternative payment methods did compared to those not or are doing during this pandemic. That could be even highly instructive. Thanks. Well, uh, Don, let me just respond. Oh, Barbara, you want to jump in. I don't want to take. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I wanted to go back to uh, Don's earlier comment about flex capacity. So Stuart, if you wanted to respond to Don's sure, please. second I, comment, please. Yes. <clears throat> I don't have I, a good answer. I like the flex idea. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I think I think one of the things that we saw here in Massachusetts and in the Northeast is the ability to respond with a surge capacity process. Hospitals um, in the Northeast trained for surge capacity have a have a certain amount of <clears throat> of ability to staff up uh, for surge capacity. What we had to do was staff not staff up but space up. And so if you take a look at what we did with, um, with building uh, and, and converting available space, unutilized space or underutilized space to be able to respond to the, the huge number of people who needed to be hospitalized, but not necessarily in the ICU. You look at what we did at the convention center, you look how we built that out, you look how quickly we put that up. Now it fortunately, that capacity was not used to its full extent. I think we're all grateful for that, but we learned how to do it. And we discovered that we could do it very well. Then the additional part of that is, how do you get the staff trained to respond to this very specific set of symptoms and circumstances where uh, somebody can be looking um, reasonably okay, and 10 minutes later can be crashing and needing to be put on a ventilator. You know, some of the clinical indications that we discovered from that were, were very subtle until they weren't. And when they weren't, they were catastrophic unless they could be responded to. And so I, I think learning how, learning from what we did is a very, very critical um, piece of our next step. Not only learning from it, but, but, but codifying it. How do we make sure that we create the book, if you will, um, because we're not done with this. We're really not done with this. We're going to have to do this again. Um, we've learned some very valuable lessons. I'd like to see us codify that and be able to move smoothly into that when we get to the next time, and we will get to the next time. Very good. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Don, <clears throat> back in the late 1980s, um, the expectation was that the whole healthcare system was going to go the way of the Kaiser system and that we could function quite nicely with a third less physicians per capita than existed because Kaiser has a model which is much less physician intense than the rest of the country. Well, we didn't go that way. We did for a while in the 90s, and then we did away with it. And so now we're screaming, uh, and particularly the healthcare community, that we don't have enough physicians. So as you think about the, as you pointed out about risk bearing and delivery system, what's going to be the delivery system of the future? Is it going to continue to be very resort or physician intensive? Or is it going to look more like the Kaiser or, and, you know, I mean, I, uh, you know, we can't answer all these questions, but at least they, they, they need to be uh, not ignored. Other questions or comments? David, I know you have more slides, so I don't want to uh, hold you up, but. Yeah, uh, well, th there's just one last slide in this particular uh, section here, which I think Stuart, you, you just um, very helpfully teed up, uh, which, and, and, uh, and others as well, um, Commissioner Berwick, thinking about the transformation and innovation um, impacts here, both on a delivery side and on a payment side, uh, such that um, we're thinking about what is, you know, what was the impact of different payment models? What would be some new payment models that um, we could perhaps pursue into the future? such as um, 
uh, a partial capitation model for primary care that both provides stability and flexibility um, uh, for providers. That's one interesting model. Um, the Maryland hospital, global hospital budget model, while very unique to Maryland, uh, may have some interesting lessons learned from it. So both on a, on a payment side, uh, Commissioner Burke, as you said, but also from a delivery side, what is what does the delivery of care look like in the future? And how can we shape our investment programs and our grant programs uh, and certification programs to really kind of lean into this, this moment of, of disruption and opportunity? Um, and to take it um, to really to move urgently on that front. So that is kind of the last big category. Um, uh, if Hannah, I don't know if you could move, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, that that talks about these issues. And and the one that I, I, I really do want to mention here too is the intersection between the economic disruption, um, the COVID pandemic, and uh, what we know about social determinants of health and, and how important it will be for the Commonwealth uh, to uh, work together to find ways to address in a really upstream way um, a whole range of, of social determinants of health at a time when many, many residents in many communities um, are going to be um, struggling with, with housing, uh, uh, thankfully, the governor extended the eviction moratorium, um, but we know that there, um, uh, and, and certainly we're not yet at a stage where the uh, unemployment checks uh, with the $600 add-on have ended, although that is eminent. Um, we, will, we will see a lot of economic disruption and social disruption, and so how do we, how can the HPC really prioritize work on social determinants of health, I think is is critical uh, as we, we think about our agenda. So a few last ideas and thoughts on this last slide. Um, one quick comment to return to Commissioner Blakeney and, and Stuart, your, your comments around kind of preparation and planning. Um, I, I, I will share, uh, I, as part of um, being able to help support the COVID-19 Command Center, I, I have two small observations. One is that the innovation and that the hospitals, hospital leadership, hospital workforce, frontline workers, that what they did in March and April to, to stand up capacity in a very short period of time is nothing short of miraculous. And, and they deserve a tremendous amount of credit at all those organizations and not just hospitals, but um, uh, where we were so focused on bed capacity and ventilators. Um, every leadership workers um, really stepped up in a big way to, to treat patients and, and made that their primary focus. And so the lessons learned from that, um, that, that first wave are being documented and, and being cataloged and, and hospitals and, and the state are really thinking about that. And Stuart, to your question of, of and, and Commissioner Blakeney of, of what happens next and how do we take those lessons learned and, and plan for, uh, you know, I, I say a potential resurgence, but others say a, a known <laughs> and inevitable resurgence. Um, that is, that is the active work of all, uh, a tremendous amount of people being led by Secretary Sutters right now. Um, so uh, wanna give, share that um, perspective with, with the commissioners. Um, so this was the last slide on the four categories of, of kind of COVID related uh, work or an adjustment of our work in, in, with a COVID lens. Um, any final thoughts on, on this? Otherwise I will move on to uh, uh, the next part of this, which is a brief discussion of our cost trends hearing. David, um, can you, um, um, I hope you have found the comments of the commissioner is helpful. Can you come up uh, and modify these slides given the number of comments that were made so that we could get an updated list of these, those issues? Absolutely. I think this is something that we would intend to revisit uh, at every board meeting moving forward um, and to give a step, you know, we'll, we'll revise these slides, but then can give a status update at, at every future public meeting and, and in between as well. But uh, yeah, but I, I think that in a number of cases, not all, I mean, you, I don't say that every comment, particularly of mine, was worth it, but um, I do think that there were a number of add-on issues 
that um, should be in the list. Um, so maybe at the next time you can, you know, just show us the ones that you've added. Yeah, we don't have to go back through the whole thing, but but it would be, uh, I think, important that we have a, sort of an upgraded list uh, uh, as quickly as we could. Will do. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for all your your thoughts. All and right. I, let me make sure that there are no uh, additional comments from the commissioners before we move on. Uh, feel free. Anybody want to jump in? I. Um, okay, David. Why don't? I, I'm sorry, Stuart. Yeah, here's a, a lingering comment. Please, sure. Um, Chris? I, I would also I would also favor uh, uh, some prioritization. Um, I mean, it, it's a worthy list that I think uh, has been added on to, but um, there are um, cert some issues that are, um, are going to become more timely uh, sooner than others. Uh, and the aforementioned uh, likelihood of uh, market consolidation or requests for approvals uh, of, of big organizations to um, to potentially join with other organizations, you know, would would jump to the top of the queue. I think that given the uh, commission's uh, mandate, so uh, there should there should be some stack. Um, and I, you know, David Seltz, I you know, I know that that's what you do. You you prioritize, um, but I I think it probably worth the, the exercise for us to um, to uh, rank order. You know, Chris, you're right. <clears throat> you know, um, I can't resist the, what's running around in my head right now. So we've been operating with our sort of key metric, which is the benchmark, which sort of sits over, in ter over all of this in terms of total spending. So you could, take one tact and say, well, there are a number of activities that have occurred during COVID that really could wind up lowering spending and maybe we ought to reconsider at a lower level the future benchmark, telehealth, uh, reduced employment, um, a consolidated a delivery system. So on one side, you could lower the benchmark. On the other side, what Barbara cautioned us in a way that I can see a lot of the delivery system saying, oh, you can't hold us back. We have to prepare for the next uh, pandemic and we need uh, 25 expansion of beds. We don't want to go through that, cr that uh, crazy time again. Uh, we need more of this and more of that and more of this. And pretty soon you don't have a benchmark anymore. So um, I think you're, um, this discussion, you know, right now we're sort of skirting around the edges of it. Um, and uh, far be it for me to say I know the right answer, but I, do, I think I do know the right questions. Um, so as we think about Chris's comments, which I totally agree with in terms of priorities, the question is, which one comes first? Anybody? <laughs> so I'll leave it at that, and you guys can send me a note on which you believe ought to be the top priorities. <laughs> because poor David and the staff are going to go crazy. We have to give them some guidance on that. So Stuart, I think that is a perfect tee up to uh, the next topic I wanted to raise, which is the cost trends hearings, because Very I think good. the Thank question of, of what we prioritize and, and focus on is, is immediately uh, on our plate because uh, we have a unique opportunity uh, this year to um, rethink and re-envision our cost trends hearings to help illuminate um, and provide information to answer the very a long list of questions and, and issues and important topics uh, that we just went through and, and others. And so um, what we're 
proposing um, for a little discussion today and then much more in the future is that we would um, plan to hold a two -day, our two-day cost trends hearings on uh, Tuesday, October 20th and Wednesday, October 21st. But it would be, it would be different than past years. Um, first, because of a change in the reporting timelines, we will not have information about the state's performance uh, against the benchmark. Uh, usually that would be the CHIA annual report, which was released in September. We now don't expect that report uh, until January. Um, so while that has always been a, a focus of the cost trends hearings, we're not gonna have that, uh, that data and information at this time. So instead, we believe that there's a tremendous opportunity to focus the hearing on the impact of COVID-19 and on many of the questions, again, that we just walked through. Um, we do think that this will likely feel and look different than, than past cost trends hearings uh, by virtue of being a, a fully virtual event. Um, and with that, we do not anticipate two full days on, on Zoom. Um, so we will need to uh, uh, have a, a, a window of time, perhaps each day, maybe two hours, uh, probably no more than two and a half hours each day um, for an opportunity to invite a speaker, but also have our panelists and have a discussion with market part participants and witnesses. Um, and so uh, a, a much more focused uh, event um, and a, a shorter event, but one that we think can be really impactful. And so it will be incumbent on uh, all of you and all of us to be um, uh, very specific about what the focus areas that we want to dive in on. Because uh, we could spend, obviously, uh, many, many days talking about a lot of different issues. And so uh, with, a, uh, with this revised vision, what are the areas that we really want to prioritize our conversations at this important public event? Um, so it speaks to the prioritization question that you just raised, Stuart. All right. Uh, Tim? Yeah, uh, David, thanks. And for all the, I agree that prioritization is going to be critical. And clearly, the cost trends hearing can uh, help figure out what those priorities are leading up to it. So um, I think that's a good conversation to continue. One thing just pops up for me is again, going back to the equity lens that you know the impact uh, of COVID-19 on uh, particular uh, people of color in Massachusetts might be a real good focus for this hearing and making sure that that space is created to have a conversation of uh, who's, you know, who got impacted both the workforce and the folks um, that uh, got the virus, but also, you know, the impact on the care systems that they rely on. So I just think there's a big subject that we should really hone in on at this cost trends hearing. Um, Thank you. David, um, I'm thinking about the po po possibility in the, to turn the questions, some of them that I raised and others have raised, into a question and then having a form of a debate and have specific speakers that either take one side or the other, like for example, over the, over the benchmark, you know, while we're talking about the, positive, the impact of COVID to be a permanent increase in spending, keep it the same or reduce it, something like that. Um, you know, what are we doing on some of these other things as well, and um, and have this, because we tend to get speakers that only defend themselves over time, and it gets a little repetitive. This way, we can sort of focus in and allow the the uh, cost, and you could provide some basic information before that, just on the trends, and then at, and at the end of that, lay out the question, and then have the speakers. So. Uh, is a form of a debate. I just throw that out, listening to what's going on and thinking about a somewhat different format. I don't hear a rousing. Uh, we got we got two a couple hands raised. All right, Ron. Uh, here's something that I'm not sure you you'd want to cover, but I do think it has an impact on cost trends going forward. And that's the failure of the current administration and the impact that this had, not only on lives, but on what we can expect in terms of cost going forward. 
and what they've done and how they've failed and what that impact has been. And how can we really look at the future costs without taking into account the failures that have taken place and the impact of those failures? Tim? I think we're almost up with the federal administration for the record for him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, the one thing I wanted to add too, and I, I guess it goes a little bit to uh, the issue of so much to look at and so little time to do it and the importance of all the work is, I just don't know how we have a conversation around the impact of the coronavirus on the healthcare system in Massachusetts and its populations without talking about nursing homes uh, and long-term care. Uh, it's just clearly, I know uh, Under Secretary Peters and I and others have been working hard on that issue, but it seems like that needs to be somehow that has to come into the conversation. I know it's kind of a little bit outside of the, the focus of the HPC, but clearly long-term care spending and its impact on residents and the care model and workers. I mean, it's, it's really a, had a big role to play. And so I don't know how uh, we, we don't have some conversation around nursing homes and uh, home care as well. David Cutler. Thanks, Tim. Um, well, I agree with all the comments. I'll just throw in that, you know, I think we're one of our primary tasks is to be monitoring the cost of medical care. And I think along with that comes the quality, but um, particularly as it's related to the cost angle. And so we, I think um, we ought, it might be helpful to have a discussion about, okay, spending in 2020 is super low. It's going to be super low. That's, you know, whether it's 10% below or if it goes even more below or whatever it is, is that essentially a new baseline from which the Commonwealth ought to work? That is, you know, should we basically say, look, this was a big savings in the Commonwealth spending and, we, and so now we're working from here? Or is the expectation that, no, you know, that was just one time and then, um, and then we're going to go back to the old number and whatever it was above that from there? Good. Don? Uh, well, let me first endorse David's last comment. That seems like a crucial topic, um, the nature of the baseline and benchmark, and that goes along with your earlier comment, Stuart. Uh, this is a question, probably the answer is no, but uh, sh since this will be just before the presidential election, should we reserve any time at this hearing to uh, take a quick look at what the Democratic Republic plat platforms are pre-election and what their implications may be for the state? in terms of, uh, of both COVID-19 management and the overall budget picture. Interesting. Stuart, I'll, I'll defer to you on that. Yeah, I'll listen. I, 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 um, I think it's worth um, some, if not extended discussion, particularly to the extent that they have articulated views. Um, and there's no question, we know that there are some pretty fundamental differences, particularly in terms of coverage. Um, so David uh, Seltz, I think you should think about weaving some of that into the, at least the uh, background material that uh, either your staff or some of the outside speakers will discuss. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and I'm seeing uh, Cassandra raised her hand. Hi, Cassandra. I just wanted to add that I think um, coming away from the last cost trends hearing, we wanted to incorporate the consumer experience into the next round. And obviously we're in a very different situation now than we expected to be back then when we made that decision. But if there is a way to not lose sight of that, perhaps through the COVID lens along the lines of what others have already been saying, I think that would be worth um, maintaining if possible as a priority. Very good. Thank you, yeah. I, I agree. Uh, Chris? Yeah, let me, I just want to, um, Reinforce Tim Foley's comment about um, the need to look at, at nursing homes. It 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 is a uh, it's a real uh, black mark, um, not just on Massachusetts but in the Northeast. Uh, uh, I think, as everyone knows, that you know, the death rates from COVID 
in our state and really throughout the Northeast uh, was disproportionately high in nursing homes and way greater than the rest of the nation. I mean, we're still at um, eight or 10 times the death rates of the states that are in the news, um, Arizona, California, uh, uh, Florida, the counties really that are in the news, uh, Maricopa, LA County, and Harris County, and Miami-Dade County. Uh, their, uh, their death rates are, are uh, extraordinarily low compared to ours. And ours are disproportionately high because of nursing homes. And, um, I think it has uh, it, it, to, to not um, at least have a, um, a, a, a small section of that uh, during the cost trans hearing, um, I mean, because the human cost, at least in this case, is um, is, is staggering. So I, I I don't know how you you weave it in uh, uh, under the uh, under the mission of the uh, of the commission, but um, I, I I would just throw up another hand and say um, we we should have something. Uh, to to uh, to reflect the the tragedy that has befallen us, and uh, to shift gears um, and, and to remind everyone, we we I think twice a year we have a report on low value care, and this gets to uh, uh, Stewart's comment about should should we be looking at a different uh, permanent benchmark and. You know, I, I did vote against the, the benchmark uh, um, uh, six weeks ago or four weeks ago um, for this reason, because I do think we, we have a, we just don't have enough information right now to, to know what, whether or whether there is a new baseline and what that, what that baseline is. But low value care is something that we know is out there. Um, I'm of the hope that uh, this will drive low value care out of the system and thereby reduce uh, overall cost in the system in the same way that technology efficiencies like telemedicine and acute care at home uh, drive uh, efficiencies relative to the high cost, uh, high fixed cost uh, structure of, of offices and, and hospitals. So I think it's a really, it's such an interesting topic and I, I, I agree, Stuart, if we could get uh, witnesses that can take uh, opposing uh, perspective, we, we could have a lively discussion and, and learn something. Yeah. Um, anyone else before David moves on? Yes, Stuart, I would just add, um, and picking up on Cassandra's point about the consumer, uh, hearing the consumer voice, I think we also need to hear from local communities. A lot of uh, the response of COVID-19 has fallen on local public health departments mm -hmm. in this state. And I think uh, we have some communities that have been uh, devastated. I think it would be uh, Im important to hear from those uh, local communities, whether the local public health uh, officials or others in those communities. Okay, that's a good point. <clears throat> Any other quick comments? These are really great. Um, I'm sure David is taking good notes. Um, all right, uh, David Sells, uh, do you want to move on? Sure, um, and, and just want to say thank you for all of those comments. And uh, one advantage of our new virtual ro world is we don't need to take notes because there is a video now, and so we'll refer back to that um, and get everyone's thoughts. I, you know, I would uh, add, um, we do have a board meeting in September and we also have committee meetings at the end of September. And, and that may be an opportunity to use some of those, that public meeting time uh, to touch on some of these issues as well. So uh, we need not need to fit it all within the two, uh, two days. Um, and there could be other opportunities to have those really important public conversations. So, um, Thank you for your kind of uh, endorsement of at least moving forward with a cost trends hearing this year. That wasn't a, a foregone conclusion, um, but it, it feels like um, a sense of consensus among commissioners that uh, this would be worthwhile for us to um, plan and pursue this year in a different format. Even and Stuart, I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just, I, I can't help endorsing the 
point, I think, I don't know, it was Marty or Chris made it about uh, uh, some time in the hearing for kind of a human mm. recognition of the tragedy that, that this should, there should be an emotional moment there because I, I really think that's, that, that's an important idea. Thanks. Sorry. No, no, thank you. Um, and, and the last point I will make on this is, is just um, for our um, market participants who may be watching this live stream, uh, we know that the hearings uh, can be uh, a lift in terms of preparation and participation. And, and of course, we will balance that uh, against other needs, um, depending on the, the COVID uh, pandemic situation. So um, uh, that will be reflected in one, the fact that we are, are uh, limiting uh, or shortening the time um, but will also be a consideration as we think about potential uh, pre-file testimony questions. All of that will be balanced, recognizing that there are other dynamics and priorities that providers and health plans are focused on. Um, so, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Who, who's, does somebody want to say something? Um, I'm looking at the, the clock here. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, David, um, I think I'd like to sort of jump up and take a, a quick discussion of um, your contract, which means you probably should uh, take a five minute uh, coffee break um, and let us talk about that, if you don't mind. Happy to. All right, get out of here. Okay, um, let me tee this up. Um, <clears throat> Um, as part of the legislation and good practice, uh, every several years, uh, we are asked to and do a, um, there you go. We're just putting the vote up on the screen. Okay. Every uh, several years, we are asked to and want to do a, an assessment of how well our executive director is doing. Oh, uh, we had such a good report last time from Wendy Everett, and that even though she has no law, she has left us as a commissioner, um, I took it upon myself with the uh, endorsement of the, um, of the administration and finance committee to ask Wendy to conduct a follow-up. Um, and, uh, as in the past, she did an unbelievable job. Um, I can summarize her uh, report in a couple of words. He is fantastic uh, at every dimension that she asked people, whether it was other commissioners, staff, outside groups, people on the street, whoever she talked to, had nothing but praise for David. I've asked Wendy to provide each of you with a summary. She said it was, it was the hardest thing to do was to write a short summary because she had so much information. Um, um, if you get to see Wendy, uh, please thank her. I did uh, several times when we met. Um, so, um, Based on Wendy's uh, assessment and uh, our own views, the uh, Administration and Finance Committee uh, voted unanimously to authorize me as the chair to negotiate a new multi-year contract with the terms consistent with comparable state government positions. So I now bring it before the full commission uh, to ask for authorization to move forward on these negotiations. Um, so before I ask for a vote, uh, I would welcome any comments or questions. <coughs> Not hearing any. Um, Colleen? Commissioner Cutler just raised his hand, Stuart. Oh. Okay, Commissioner Cutler, please. So I'm, I'm uh, strongly in favor of this. Um, I just want to ask whether Wendy offered any thoughts uh, around improvement, areas for where David could improve, where we could help David, talk to him, give him whatever advice or support that he needs to do. 
Any d advice to what? Did she suggest any advice that the commission gives to David about areas where he might do better, he might do differently, he might approach things? Differently? Well, and uh, there really were few. The one area that came up, well, two, uh, two areas that came up, which is uh, one was, you know, whether th there's too much material um, presented and which at, at times puts frustrations upon us because at one hand we want to have fuller discussion and we have to sort of rush through things. And David and Colleen are very mindful of that. I did point out that, that um, uh, the presentations are multifaceted. On the one hand, they're to educate us. On the other hand, it's important that we get to know the staff and to see all the good things they're doing. So while some of us could uh, stand less, we also need to be mindful of why David brings that material forward. So that was one. Um, and let me get the second, and then I'll turn it to ask Ron what he... The second one was apparently that a number of you questioned the value of the, um, of the October cost trends hearings. Um, I did indicate that they are legislated and we are required to do it. And I think we had a good discussion on how we could make some changes in it to make it more meaningful. So those were the two. Um, you know, uh, Wendy is mindful of, and as only Wendy would do about, you know, making sure that, you know, David doesn't work himself totally off of the deep end. He assured us that um, he's still in control, which is good to know. Uh, so um, those were the comments. Um, Ron, did you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I look at, what David has been able to achieve. And overall, given my experience and the folks that I deal with in the healthcare industry, uh, we're lucky in Massachusetts to have him. Uh, he would obviously make significantly more money if he were in the private sector. And he's probably, out of the folks I, I deal with on a daily basis, he's probably the most knowledgeable when we look at the topics that, that we cover. And he does an excellent job of managing the organization. And yeah, we try to cover a lot of material and I give him a lot of credit for that, but we should be thankful to have him. Thank you, Ron. Any other questions or comments anybody wants to raise? Again, I know you all talk to Wendy's. So you're and in the complete report without mentioning your names, your comments are, are preceded there. All right, if Stuart, I haven't- Stuart, can I move the motion? Absolutely, thank you very thank you. much. Uh, there is a movement of the motion and now uh, we're gonna take a roll call vote and Colleen is gonna help us by reading off your names and let me know whether you agree to allow me to negotiate with David. Yes, Which, was there way? a second on the motion? Second. 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 Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, how do you vote? Uh, I vote in favor, yes. Mr. Vice Chairman Cohen? Yes. Commissioner Berwick? Aye. Commissioner Blakeney? Aye. Commissioner Cutler? Yes. Commissioner Foley? Aye. Commissioner Kreider? Yep. Commissioner Lord? Aye. Commissioner Master Giovanni? On yes, yes. Right. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Peters? Aye. Aye, and Commissioner Roeder? Yes. Unanimous, thank you. Very good. Um, well, if anything is like the last negotiations, it was in reverse. I kept wanting to give him more, and David just insisted that he not stand out from his peers Although I tried to explain to him, he has no peers. Uh, I don't want to be disrespectful of others who work for the state, but from my little humble way, he's, he is a giant. So I'm sure I'm going to have the same discussion with him. 
But I want to thank everyone, and uh, again, and I want to particularly thank Wendy for the job she did. Um, all right, why don't we we have a we still have time to get into this whole discussion of equity. So let's yes, David, back. Great. I'm back. All right. Well, you know, we don't want you to go on the unemployment line, so uh, it was unanimous that you and I have tough negotiations following this meeting. Well, um, I, will, I will chalk this up to another unique experience in this COVID uh, that I had my job performance review broadcast on, on live YouTube channel. Um, but I do really want to say to the members of the board, I'm, I'm humbled um, truly by your, your trust and confidence in me. Um, I'm excited to enter into, uh, to continue my, my work here at the Health Policy Commission. Um, I'm, I'm truly honored to have a career in public service and to work on behalf of the people of the Commonwealth. Um, it's what I've always wanted to do. Um, and I am as energized today uh, as I was 17 years ago when I started in the State House, and, and uh, almost eight years ago at the Health Policy Commission. And that energy is really fueled by um, a recognition of, of the challenge uh, that we face. Um, and the next topic is, is really uh, a particular area that I am um, personally uh, very invested in um, advancing and pursuing. And, and it is a part of why I'm so energized to um, continue working with um, the truly best staff um, in the country. Um, uh, I learn from them every single day um, and to be a part of a job and to be part of a culture where learning is prioritized and honesty and collaboration um, is uh, central to how we do our work. Uh, is um, uh, the honor of a lifetime. So uh, look forward to uh, talking to you, Stuart, about next steps. Um, but um, just as importantly, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, pursuing this next agenda item uh, with you and the board and with the staff of the HPC, which is to, to really develop and, and implement uh, an explicit uh, health equity framework uh, at the Health Policy Commission. So I think we can uh, move into into this topic and and um, we'll spend the next um, big chunk of the meeting here uh, on this. I, I would just want to say at the, at the outset uh, issues of, of of health equity, equity, racial justice are um, so important to so many members to all the members of this board, to all the members of our staff and and you as board members have encouraged uh, me and, and the staff at HPC to, to really be articulate and explicit about uh, how we incorporate principles of equity uh, and embed them uh, into our work. And so um, we, we see a tremendous opportunity for the Health Policy Commission to be uh, a leader among state agencies, not only here, but across the country uh, in developing and releasing our own statement of, on how we apply equity principles to, to our work. And that's really what we hope to, uh, that's what we plan to present to you today um, for your feedback. Um, the imperative for action is clear. Uh, the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color and ongoing injustices of police brutality across the country uh, exposed systemic racism and deeply embedded structural inequities. Um, we know that these inequities are not unique to the healthcare system, um, but are reflected in persistent uh, health disparities and increased disease burden for communities of color uh, and other marginalized populations. Um, these inequities include differences in disease prevalence, access to services, affordability of services, quality of care, treatment practices, outcomes, morbidity and mortality, uh, among many others. And in addition to their impact on health and well-being, these inequities result in higher healthcare spending and an imbalanced and, and unjust distribution of resources for both individuals and for all the people of the Commonwealth. Um, so we, we are here today to um, uh, present to you on a health equity framework. The definition, I, I won't walk through the definitions on the bottom part of this slide other than to say that 
we base this on uh, an equity definition that is used by other state agencies in Massachusetts, um, including uh, the Department of Public Health, Health Equity Advisory Group. Um, and, and that it's important um, for us to be uh, really articulate in, in uh, how exactly we plan to apply this framework. This is not just a document, uh, this is a plan for action. So the next slide um, is a visual representation of a concept that was fundamental for our development of this framework. And, and this slide is really illustrating a, a racism first approach to um, thinking about structural inequities that impact health outcomes. And those, there are many structural inequities. This is not an exhaustive uh, list of bubbles, but include homophobia, ableism, xenophobia. And while other prejudices have impacts on, on the upstream social determinants of health, illustrated on this slide in, in the blue uh, buckets, uh, for example, on social capital or on housing, uh, racism has been proven to, to not only have an impact on these social determinants, but in and of itself is a social determinant of health that has a harmful impact on health. So it is therefore really pivotal to address the impact of systemic racism as we implement and develop this health equity framework to guide the HPC's work. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our Deputy Executive Director at the Health Policy Commission, Colleen Nelsonmeyer who's gonna walk through a little bit of the process that we went through for developing these slides and this, and this framework um, and, and where we, uh, later where we plan to go next. Um, but Colleen, I'll turn it over to you. Great, yes, happy to, thanks David. So first I wanted to apprise the board on the process for developing this health equity framework. We did this in a way that was inclusive of all of our staff every team at the Health Policy Commission selected and was represented on an internal drafting committee. So this was truly a staff-driven process that David and I are presenting to you today, the end result of, of it. Also, we brought this draft deck before today's meeting through our advisory council and other stakeholders who work day-to-day -day on advancing health equity, racial equity, racial justice. So. Uh, before I move on, I just want to shout out the HPC's Health Equity Framework Drafting Committee. So this is uh, Yua Wong, Wendy Nicholas, Hannah Klumach, Gia Leung, Sasha hayes -Bisnock. Thank you for your thoughtful and thorough work for representing all the staff. So this was just potentially the most collaborative work product ever at the agency. And on behalf of all HPC staff, David and I are very proud to put it forward today for your consideration. So. You'll see on this slide an updated HPC mission statement that puts health equity front and center. Uh, last year, we updated our mission statement to clearly represent that the agency's work is in service of all residents across the Commonwealth. However, in light of the pervasive inequities that persist within the healthcare system, we felt it was important to make clear that the HPC's work for all residents cannot be accomplished without making our system more equitable. Important to note for those in the audience watching today that may not know, the HPC's enabling statute clearly states that we should establish these goals to reduce health disparities and eliminate health disparities and address social determinants of health so that everyone can attain their full health potential. This is truly core to the HPC's mission. So we are committed to this, but how are we going to advance health equity and promote social and economic justice throughout our work? So we are proposing today to you, uh, the commissioners of the Health Policy Commission, for your consideration, an action plan to ensure that health equity is a core component of the HPC's work today and moving forward. So Hannah, on the next slide, um, to achieve the HPC's goal of better health and better care at a lower cost for all, as David Seltz outlined, the HPC must take into account the structural and systemic barriers that preclude certain groups from attaining their full health potential. So foundational to centering these health equity considerations are five principles for integrating health equity into the HPC's work. So I'm gonna quickly uh, review the five principles with you now. So first of all, the HPC acknowledges the pervasiveness of health inequities and the systemic racism that underlies them and that eliminating inequities is integral to achieving the HPC's mission of better health and better care at a lower cost for all residents of the Commonwealth. Second principle is that the HPC will embed 
health equity concepts in all aspects of our work and will apply all four of its core strategies to the goal of advancing health equity in the Commonwealth, which David Seltz will walk through in one minute. But just to remind you, the role that the HBC plays in the Commonwealth is to research and report, to serve as a convener, to be a watchdog, and to be a partner. Importantly, this is very important, our work will be informed and guided by those with lived experience of inequities. Um, fourth, that the HBC commits to educate itself about the impact of systemic racism and will promote diversity and equity inclusion in our own workplace in order to more for, fully cultivate the culture of anti-racism within our own agency and workplace. And then finally, and last but not least, underlying all of this is the concept of partnership. So advancing health equity in the Commonwealth is a shared responsibility. That's how we see it. The HBC is actively seeking opportunities to align, to partner, to support our sister agencies in the administration, the healthcare system, and organizations working for health equity on all of these goals. Okay, going to turn the deck now back to David Sell to detail how we're using all of our four core strategies to advance health equity. Thank you, Colleen. And, and I'll, David, I'll, yep. can I stop you for one minute? Because I know some of our people have to leave, and I don't want to, to go them to leave without, if they have any comments about, these were beautifully said and, and well laid out, but I know Ron has to leave and a few of the others. So are there any comments about these five before David goes into more detail? Again, I want to thank those who have to leave, and hopefully most of you can stay while we work through them. But um, all right, David, why don't you take it back? Th thank you, Stuart. And um, we'll we'll talk through a few more slides here, and then and then stop, and really want to open it up for for some conversation and and feedback. Um, taking these principles, and then on the next slide applying them to our four uh, core strategies. Um, so Hannah, can you just, thank you. Um, so these, these are the four core strategies that we have laid out uh, many times before and, and help organize our, our work and priorities. Um, and so the next few slides walk through each of these uh, roles that the HPC plays and provide some examples of, of how we intend to, how we have been and intend to and will uh, apply an equity lens in each of these uh, domains. So the first one is on research and reporting. Uh, this is obviously uh, an important part of the HPC's work um, in analyzing data, understanding data and using data to inform policy recommendations. And so here uh, in, in the bullets here, you can see um, a really prioritization around making sure that we have uh, both the data that will enable us to do the types of uh, analyses that we think are, are critically important to understand disparate impacts on different populations across a range of issues, both in terms of cost, quality, access. Um, and unfortunately, uh, many of our data sets are limited or compromised in some ways that make doing the even basic analysis very difficult. And so I think um, embedded in, in, these, in the bullets is, is really two concepts. One is around uh, a commitment to improve both uh, the collection and quality of the data, working with others to be able to do that, um, but then also to be very intentional about uh, in undertaking research projects uh, that we are at the outset thinking about the questions um, and how we can use these analysis to understand, again, just disproportionate impacts uh, by income, geography, race, ethnicity, um, uh, many other different uh, variables. Um, the example at the bottom here is in, uh, intended to be an example of, of how uh, this could apply in a more concrete way. So this example here is um, uh, related to our focus on affordability. Uh, where in the past we have examined um, the variation in what people pay out of pocket or in premiums and have been able to break that down um, uh, by a number of different uh, uh, subpopulations. And that many cases um, indicate an um, unequal or unjust or inequitable distribution of both resources and, and who is responsible for, for paying for healthcare. 
Um, so would intend and commit to continuing to apply an equity lens to our research and reporting work. The second uh, slide here is on our convening role. Um, and, and the nature of the HPC is a unique one in our ability to um, engage the public, engage uh, the market, and to uh, contribute to a conversation um, beyond even our board and ourselves. And so would seek to use that role and um, commit to utilizing that role uh, to spotlight and to highlight uh, equity related issues in healthcare. And um, I think the applying an equity lens that we are proposing here is uh, to make equity a focus at this upcoming 2020 annual healthcare cost trends hearing. So thank you, Commissioner Foley, for that uh, great suggestion. Uh, we agree and we think that that uh, is an important uh, an opportunity to um, include discussions of equity and the disparate impact of COVID-19 um, in this, our annual and most um, uh, high profile public event. Um, but a, an intention and a commitment, not just to have this at the cost trends hearings, but to really think about this intentionally moving forward. The third lens in action here, our, our role is a, our role as a market watchdog. Um, and here too, we believe that there are important analyses that should be conducted when considering uh, provider mergers, affiliations and expansions about what the impact of those will be, not just on, on market competition, but on the ability of organizations to provide for care for um, uh, diverse populations, um, communities of color, low income populations and uh, to understand how the current structure and distribution of healthcare resources is meeting or in many cases not meeting uh, the needs of, of the residents. And so um, here again in our, in the applying an equity lens example, um, I would note in our last cost and market impact review, which was an analysis of the Beth Israel Leahy merger, um, we dedicated a, a, a significant part of that analysis to understanding uh, how the coming together of those two organizations uh, would impact um, their ability to serve for low income populations. Um, and those results, um, I, I believe it's fair to say, directly resulted in a set of conditions um, as part of the approval uh, that made investments in behavioral health care, investments in certain community health centers and community hospitals a requirement of that transaction moving forward. So an example, again, of how we can and will uh, include this in uh, our market oversight work. And then finally, um, we have a role as a partner. Um, we are a partner to providers through our investment programs and our certification programs and here to see uh, a, a great opportunity to, opportunity to be intentional about how our investment programs and, and certification programs can be designed to uh, include health equity elements as, for example, competitive factors and selection criteria uh, in the outcomes that we are tracking and the data that we are collecting. And the example here um, is the Mass Up Investment Program, uh, which we authorized at the last board meeting uh, which is supporting four partnerships between healthcare providers and community organizations to address a social an upstream social determinant of health that is leading to health inequities and and we are in the process right now of of beginning to launch that program and are in active conversations with our awardees to talk about um, how we might be able to measure the impact of our investments specifically on some of these domains and what data and information uh, we would want to collect um, and in addition, how we might collect um, beyond just data uh, information about the experience of, of patients and having the patient voice be um, a stronger component of our evaluation work when thinking about our investment programs. So those are, are very um, small examples of a much longer list that the staff uh, and we have, have compiled together. I'm, I'm happy to share all of uh, the different examples, but um, I think our intent uh, and our commitment is to uh, really build this into every part of, of how we do our work. Um, and as Colleen will, will talk about in a minute, um, 
uh, not just our work, but our, our workplace uh, as well. Um, so the final slide I'll, I'll just present on here really quickly before opening it up is, is just an example of, of, of how you actually put some of this into action. And this is a, an example of an equity lens. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this concept, but really it's, it's a set of questions um, that you commit to answering um, uh, and be thoughtful about at every stage of, in this case, a program development, implementation, and closeout. Um, again, these are not um, exhaustive uh, questions, but uh, are intended to challenge um, uh, prejudices, preconceived uh, assumptions uh, at every stage, and to be intentional about uh, what we intend, who we are including uh, in at the table, um, and and how we describe and and evaluate the impacts of of our our policy and programs. Um, so with that, uh, I think worth pausing and and opening up for discussion uh, about uh, your um, what you think about that HPC having a health equity framework like this. Uh, how you may see the intersection between equity principles and our, our current work streams and, and would really be uh, open and, and welcome uh, any comments and feedbacks about um, how we can be bold on this particular um, concept. All right, uh, comments or questions from the commissioners? Uh, hi, Stuart, it's, it's Barbara. <clears throat> sure. David, I think it's a, this is a wonderful initial step. I think it's extraordinarily well thought out. Um, and nicely designed. Um, I keep going back whenever we think about equity to the statement that Don Berwick um, brings up frequently, which is nothing about me without me. And um, I wonder how going forward, the commission might be informed from, from the populations that are most disenfranchised by by the biases and the and the perceived notions, how do we put together some sort of an advisory mechanism that we can run things by, that we can check things out with, um, that we can engage with? Um, I know I do a lot of work with the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, and we have a community advisory board made up of homeless people and formerly homeless people. And I, I have to say that they inform all of the work that we do in ways that are profoundly and fundamentally important. And I just, I just wonder how we capture that ability and the work going forward. I think that that strengthens us if we, can, if we can look to creating some sort of an advisory capacity in the work that we're doing. Just, just a suggestion. Um, thank you. And, and just to, to quickly respond, I, we agree. You know, this is this is a first step, um, but it is also a first step towards an action plan. And and every one of these concepts and ideas um, will require us to to take action. Um, and so, on that particular idea of having an advisory council, that is absolutely on our list. We we have an HPC advisory council, um, but there may I think there is an opportunity to to rethink or to have. Um, different voices at the table um, that can help inform our work in this particular area and the commitment and the principle that Colleen mentioned of, of really um, being intentional about incorporating the perspectives of people with lived experience is, I, I think, why we, we were strong about including that as one of our five key principles. So I appreciate the comment and, and agree and, and would like, love to think with you about how to actually do that. Great. Great Thank idea. you. Rick? Rick, unmute yourself. Yes, okay, thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, so I really wanna create, uh, congratulate David and Colleen and the team there um, for articulating so well this, what this equity framework will look like for the HBC. I mean, it's, you've really done a wonderful job. So the only question I had, and I didn't see it in there, but maybe it is, um, now, how are we going to measure whether we're making progress? How do we document successes? I mean, these are all really worthy goals, but um, sometimes I don't think we do a good enough job of evaluating progress along the way. So just wondering what your thoughts there are. 
I think uh, we have to hold ourselves to having measurable outcomes in this area. I think having uh, targets and goals is, is critical to be able to track our progress and to hold ourselves accountable to the commitments that we're making. Um, and in fact, as, as Colleen um, was on the, the slide that Colleen presented, our, our statute actually asks us to, to set goals. Um, and so uh, I think uh, what those goals are, how we measure them, I, I don't have that plan for you here today, Rick, um, mm -hmm. but I agree that it is an essential and critical part that we think about how we measure, track progress, and hold ourselves accountable in the same way that the benchmark has been so critically powerful in, in doing just that and in having a measurable goal by which we can uh, organize and, and, and coordinate efforts and activities. And so uh, a, a note of agreement and I'll stop there. Uh, Don, do you want to respond to this particular area or you want to bring in another issue? I, I just to say thank you to David. That's all. I mean, uh, to see this taken this seriously is it's just it makes me feel proud of the whole group. And Colleen, thank you. That was a beautiful presentation. It all begins at home. And so the part of your plan that says we're going to apply this internally in the work of the commission and the workplace, that's that's absolutely crucial. And the board and the commission itself has to be a player. So thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Let me, uh, uh, Rick. Uh, I, I, I think your comments or question is so right on, but the reality is that there is going to be a short term, an intermediate term, and a long term. Um, much as I'm not a big believer all the time in <clears throat> what I would call process um, evaluations or process um, criteria, I think in the very short term, the uh, most likely thing would be process or pr have the processes been put in place, like Barbara's comment about an advisory group. Mm -hmm. um, are there, and there'd be others. And then you move from that to some demonstrable activities. Ultimately, the end product, of course, is better health for these communities. And that, unfortunately, but reality-wise, is a long-term complicated process. So um, you're absolutely right. I think the staff needs to, the way they do wonderfully with these charts, I think we need to put together these various levels and what we can expect at that those levels. Tim, you want to say something? Yeah, again, just um, joining the chorus of voices. Um, I think this is a really good presentation. I was reading it and thinking about questions I would have or things that were missing. And I think there's a lot here that's been covered. Um, I second the comments about the need for an advisory committee to work with us. I think it's uh, fairly obvious that the board we sit on is, I think all of us uh, are, you know, are white or, um, you know, relate to being white. So I think it's really important that we have that voice in the mix. And, you know, 1199 clearly is a, uh, an organization representing mostly people of color and women of color in healthcare. Uh, we've been doing a lot of this work and my only uh, advice and, go and focus going forward is sticking with this. Uh, it's not easy to continue these conversations. I think as the chorus of voices quiets down, it's gonna be really hard to maintain a focus with all the priorities and I just challenge all of us um, that as we go down this path um, that we stay and remain committed to it and there's going to be challenges to that there's going to be a lot of competing priorities and time um, that all the issues that we have to deal with as we just went through um, and it's really hard to keep the focus and commitment both uh, to David and Colleen to look internally um, critically important but a lot of work um, and it's not easy. It's not meant to be easy, it's really hard. And so I think the stick to itness of this uh, is gonna be just as important as uh, the outcomes because we're gonna, it, there will be challenges to the focus. And I think we just gotta remember um, this presentation and the goals and the mission as Colleen, I think rightfully pointed out, it's embedded in the mission of the commission um, that we gotta stick with it um, and everything that we do going forward. And I do, again, really believe that we should be reaching out to the communities most impacted by this to hear their voices in 
uh, the work that we do. And I think the, the presentation and the goals as laid out are spot on in the process to reach it with engaging all staff to do so was critically important. And then us as a commission, we got to hold each other accountable, uh, you know, in, a, in months and in months and years to come that we keep this focus um, where it needs to be because it is hard to keep the focus and we, there will be challenges to it. And that I know I'm committed and all of you are committed to, to keep that focus and commitment going forward so we don't lose faith in the process and the outcomes and the goals of the presentation as presented. Great job, Tim, absolutely. Any other questions or comments, anybody? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I had one, uh, Stuart. Uh, I'm reminded that a year ago, uh, or a little more than a year ago, we uh, rejected the B.I. Leahy uh, merger uh, and the attorney general went on to approve um, with guardrails. And my recollection is one of those guardrails was um, to uh, hold uh, B.I. Lay Deaconess uh, to some um, uh, expected uh, engagement of the, uh, of the community uh, or serving a broader community. I can't remember what the language was but it was a reflection of the uh, lack of Medicaid case mix uh, at uh, B.I. B. Leahy Deaconess. So I, to, to Rick's a point about um, um, uh, accountability, you know, there may be something quantifiable that um, the Attorney General is keeping track of in terms of investment in the community that um, uh, we should just keep our eyes on um, as, as because um, there, there's a there's a need for more money to go uh, into the community, and in, at least in that particular case, it was um, it wasn't a suggestion; it was a requirement. Dave, uh, David, David Seitz, you, uh, you can uh, refresh my memory on that, but I, I got it right, don't I? Yes, there there were explicit conditions on on a whole host of of. Uh, uh, issues, as you mentioned, the, the low Medicaid uh, case mix. Uh, there were requirements about um, outreach to, to uh, different populations. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm, it's a great point, uh, Dr. Kreider, because I think in the watchdog slide area, I think we were, uh, the, the words here are a little bit more focused on kind of when and something is being proposed to us. But I think there is also a role for us to uh, do ongoing monitoring and accountability uh, of organizations that when they do propose a consolidation and are saying that they will do uh, work in these areas that we actually, uh, with other agencies, do that retrospective analysis as well to see what exactly happened uh, when those commitments, whether required or not, are, are being made. So I, that's a great suggestion. Very good. Any other questions or comments? David, you wanna move on? And this is a very important area. I think everyone in the commission, and I know the staff feels very strongly about this, which is great. Uh, Colleen, are you gonna follow sure. up? Sure, yes. So I just have one more slide here, and this slide is actually really responsive to some of the board comments. So recognizing that expanding our health equity focus involves additional effort and coordination, and that our portfolio of responsibilities is already large and continues to expand based on the discussion earlier this meeting. I won't go through this whole slide, but do want to highlight the top priorities for immediate action items. So first and foremost, adoption of with, with the board's endorsement, adoption of the new HPC mission statement and the health equity framework that we presented here today. Um, second, I would mention a development and implementation of an operational framework to incorporate health equity principles and lens in all of our work streams that David Seltz walked through. Um, we want to engage experts to provide staff training and promote diversity, equity, inclusion in our own workplace, as mentioned. So we're already engaged in that process. Um, want to mention, as Commissioner Blakeney said, establishing real partnerships with external stakeholders to advance equity, such as setting up an advisory council, um, and then finally, just building off of Commissioner Lord's comments, I just want to also, um, we are absolutely committed to, to the development of uh, clear metrics, objectives, and goals, and frankly, that's what the HBC does best. So we feel 
strongly that we can that we can do that. And I just I just want to close by just thanking you from me and Director Seltz and all of the staff for your support of both our past work and the increased focus now. Many of you have been very supportive at public meetings, but also behind the scenes of us and our staff as as we pursue this this new focus. So so thank you so much. All right, David, turning it back to you. Okay, <clears throat> David. All right, so uh, we have uh, just a few very short things in my executive director's report, which I can do in minutes. Um, so the first slide here will not walk through, but just to highlight for the public that we are continuously putting out publications. The starred publications here um, were recently released um, uh, and wanted to highlight specifically the drug coupon study, which is, which is now on our website. Uh, some of these other uh, reports uh, will be released imminently. Um, so watch this space. The next slide uh, agenda item here is just, uh, I'm, I'm not going to walk all the way through these slides, um, but I did want to, and we'll leave the slides for um, the public to be able to, to look through, but did want to give a very brief update to the board on our drug pricing um, authority and our, our process for developing that. So uh, as a, a part of that, uh, we are required to develop a standard reporting form. David? Yep. Can I, uh, <clears throat> I think this is a very important area and I right. really don't think it should be shortchanged by a quick take through. I would hope that our next meeting we could focus again on this area. Um, it's a it's a complicated area that has a lot of aspects. So, um, if you wouldn't mind, and I hope with the indulgence of the commissioners themselves, that we devote the time it deserves. It's, it's an important study. Uh, absolutely. So we we will come back at the September meeting with a more fulsome update on on. Uh, all you. of our work on the drug pricing uh, review process because we we have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. I know you have, uh, and I, so, don't, I um, want to see the light of day. So that's great. So we will we will. These slides are specific to the standard reporting form. Um, we can talk about that at, at September as well. Um, but um, you know these are these are available for the public if they and and um, in particular the manufacturers who. Are interested in how we are are continuing to adapt and change this form based on their feedback, but we'll we'll spend more time on it next time, Stuart. Thank you. Anything else you want to bring up to the group? Uh, I have one final agenda item, which is our standard notices of material change. Um, so there are currently two notices that are under review, as displayed on the slide. Um, one is a proposal by South Shore Health to form a new uh, wholly owned contracting entity. Um, and the second is a proposed joint uh, venture between Emerson Hospital and Physicians Endoscopy. Um, we are in the process of, of collecting information and reviewing these notices. Um, and then since our last board meeting, um, or the last time I think we reviewed this topic, there have been uh, a number of notices that we've elected not to proceed on uh, as displayed here on this slide. Uh, I won't walk through them, um, but if there are ones that commissioners have questions on, I'm uh, happy to, to answer those at this time. Um, otherwise, this is um, the conclusion of my presentation. All right. Um, well, this was, as I expected, a very packed but important agenda. Um, the next board meeting is indicated here. Um, will be um, uh, September 15th on Tuesday, and the following one will be on the 16th of uh, December on a Wednesday, and as listed here. Um, any final comments of any of the commissioners? Again, I want to thank you, David, for, and particularly I want to thank Colleen, um, you did a phenomenal job of, of going through the actual action oriented. Um, and uh, we don't hear enough from you and I, I hope we do more in the, in the future. Um, 
Not that we don't love hearing David all the time, but it's good to hear from Colleen as well. Um, anything else? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Stay healthy, everybody. Uh, yeah. and you too, Stuart. You, thank you. Take Thanks. care of them. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. And you and I, David, need a talk. <laughs> yep. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody.